around this in the first two examples by writing quote.php, who's a middleman, a proxy of sorts that gets the data from Yahoo, then replies to me so that rather than the data going Yahoo to browser, Yahoo to browser, it's going server, Yahoo, server, browser. But now I'm this middleman. God forbid my server goes down. Now my website won't even work in terms of the, jo uh, the PHP code. So it's just an unnecessary barrier, not to mention it requires code that I write on the server. It'd be really nice if I could just talk to Yahoo. Some companies allow you to grab their data via JSONP format, JavaScript, uh, JavaScript object notation padded format. This is just a fancy way of saying it's a different type of JSON. We've seen JSON briefly in the browser, but it's actually super simple. You may recall from earlier that what is the syntax for an array? If I have an array, we'll call it foo in JavaScript. How do I give myself an empty array? Square brackets. How do I give myself an array containing the number uh, 42? Like this, 42 comma 43, 42, 43, 44. So it's just as you would expect in most any similar language. What about now a, an object? An object in JavaScript is just the incarnation of a hash table, an associative array, a dictionary, a collection of key value pairs. The syntax for an empty one is this. How do we have key value pairs? We only briefly glimpsed this earlier. But you do it in this form, key colon value. And if you want another one, key two colon value. And this is a bit of an oversimplification. To be super proper, JSON keys and values need to be quoted, even though this is a pain in the neck. It's not strictly necessary in JavaScript. It is necessary in JSON. So this now is a collection of two key value pairs. So what if I want to get back an array of objects? I could get back an array of key colon, this is going to get tedious quickly, value key two colon, whoops, colon value. We'll stop there. So you can combine these basic syntactic constructs to come up with arrays of objects, objects with arrays inside of them, and so forth. This is essentially JSON. It's JavaScript object notation. So when Google sends back data, when Twitter sends back data, when Facebook sends back data, they're not usually using XML, which looks like HTML these days. They're using this because it's much lighter weight and more compact, among other reasons. So what's the point here? Well, if Yahoo Finance were spitting out not just JSON, but padded JSON, I could work around the same origin policy. And we won't dwell too much on the details, but padded JSON means that the data coming back from a server can be embedded into your website. As you'll see in the first project, the spec for which we'll release uh, online on Wednesday, there is a service that is coincidentally made by Yahoo called YQL, Yahoo Query Language that simply allows you to query websites like Yahoo Finance, Facebook, Google, Twitter, any website on the internet. And if they expose their data as JSON data or XML data, Yahoo query language will allow you to fetch that data and it will wrap it in this modified version of JSON called padded JSON so that you can integrate the results into your own page. So this will become much more clear in the project spec. But for now, notice that the solution is as simple as a URL that looks like this. So this URL, though, notice, hits Yahoo, their YQL server. Notice that if I really look hard in here, you can also see finance.yahoo.com mentioned. So this is essentially a URL. It took me a couple minutes to construct, and they have a little GUI that helps you figure out what the syntax should be. But this just is a URL that's going to tell Yahoo's query service to go ask Yahoo Finance for a stock quote, then return it to me in padded JSON format. And the only difference with padded JSON is that whereas Twitter a moment ago returned to us a string that looked like this, padded JSON would literally return something that looks like this so that you are tricking the server effectively into returning a snippet of JavaScript code that looks exactly like a function call. And so long as I, the developer, have written a function called callback or whatever it is, my data will get passed to that function, thereby circumventing the story that I've told, even though we haven't tripped over it ourselves. And again, you'll deliberately encounter this in the first project. And this is why you'll be using YQL to get data back from a server so that you don't have to use PHP or Python or Ruby or Java or anything in the appliance. All of your code will be client side, and you won't run afoul of this restriction. But we promise to simplify this. So our last touch to this Ajax example, which still works the same, Goog, pops up the $800.
if I view the page source, notice that I can now simplify my code as follows. I'm still using this longer URL, but that's just so that I'm avoiding the same origin issue. I could change this back to quote.php. Here is how in jQuery I can get a quote. I call dollar sign dot Ajax. So this looks a little weird, but again, remember that the dollar sign is just shorthand notation for a function called jQuery. So this is jQuery.ajax. As is common in JavaScript, as you'll see with various libraries online, many functions take not a comma separated list of arguments as their values. They often take a object of key value pairs so that the order does not matter. It's just a nice convention. Perl does this a lot, and uh, Python can do this, and other languages. So this is saying one of the keys being passed into this method is called data type, quote unquote, JSONP. I'm just telling jQuery what response to expect back. The URL is, has a value of URL, and that's it. There's a little bit of magic. Turns out, and this is just to pave the way for the first project, notice that somewhere in this long URL, I have told Yahoo that my callback function will be called handler, the name we've used before. So jQuery is actually, and this is one of these hidden features, well, it's in the documentation, but it's not obvious. jQuery, if it notices that you are contacting a server with a parameter whose value is callback equals something, jQuery will very nicely assume that, oh, when I get a response from this URL, I'm going to call your function called handler which just means that we're on the honor system here. I just have to make sure to implement this thing just like I did before. So handler expects a response. I happen to know by reading Yahoo's documentation if the response object has a query property, has a count value of one, that means I got back one stock price. And it took some trial and error to figure out what the server was sending me. But I figured out that it should equal one. And when that happens, I should output response.query.results dot row dot price. Very convoluted number of steps to get to that point. But again, you'll see in the first specification of the project exactly what that's doing and why it's doing it. Questions on, I know that was a lot. Questions on Ajax, having just started JavaScript uh, an hour ago. When the, uh, yes, when the server calls the callback function, it passes in the response argument. Also tucked away in that response argument, which I didn't bother using this time, are the 200 and details like that. Because jQuery similarly checks those kinds of things for me. So I don't have to worry as much about it. All right. So that was jQuery. So that only leaves a semester of Objective-C. So Objective-C, as we will see, is much more mind-bending, at least at first, for most people than JavaScript. But rest assured that this coming week, on Wednesday, we'll have our first lab with RJ and Rob. It'll be an opportunity to dive in hands-on with some of this code. And some of you seem to be following along with some of it. But we'll look at other examples that apply these same uh, concepts. And we'll also give you a tour of the first project, which will involve mashing together some location information, some weather, some news, some HTML, some JavaScript. And we'll leverage concepts like Ajax and the like, but won't necessarily go into as much detail as some of these things here. And you'll see the spec 2 will hold your hand through a tour of some of these uh, concepts and technologies that might be unfamiliar. And two weeks hence, in the lab 2, we'll also offer another opportunity to explore that material and specifically explore the project, for which there are roughly two weeks deadlines, as you can see in the course's syllabus, which is at cs76.net. But very quickly, will we transition to Objective-C? So what we'll do next Monday, when we return for lecture, and I unfortunately have to be at a conference, Rob will be leading us on Monday, we'll be diving into Objective-C itself. For those unfamiliar, C, Objective-C is a superset of C. For those unfamiliar with C, we will give you a crash course on Monday in C, and everything you need to know about memory management and pointers and the syntax thereof, so that we can focus really on the OO features of Objective-C and then transition toward the end of next week, um, or rather the start of week three, to the iOS SDK, Software Development Kit. And even though next week we'll spend some of our time in Xcode and or at the command line, ultimately we'll spend most of the semester in a tool that looks like this. I've opened up most of the panels uh, for this particular screenshot, but Xcode 
which is Apple's integrated development environment, similar in spirit to NetBeans or IDE or similar tools, if you're familiar, is kind of designed to make programming fun and look like iTunes, such that once you write your program, all you do is hit play and everything just works nicely in the simulator. Or if you connect a USB cable, it will burn the software onto your device if you so choose. But through this environment, we'll use uh, Objective-C. We'll use a tool called Interface Builder that allows you to construct fairly simple but fairly quickly user interfaces that are very similar in spirit to iOS uh, 6's paradigm. Um, you'll be then able to compile and run them in the simulator. Or if you have a device, again, we'll set you up with that. Um, a word on iOS 7. The tragedy of a summer course in the tragedy of WWDC, which is Apple's conference, which always happens like two weeks before the semester begins, is that they always start to, ch they announce that things are changing. And then they actually change like two months later. So we're in this sort of weird limbo state. But thankfully, there's nothing, most of the changes in iOS 7 are aesthetic so far as we would be concerned for a class like this. Underneath the hood, there's new functionality, there's some new methods, there's new, some new uh, constants and the like, but nothing that will fundamentally change any of the things we do over the next six to seven weeks. So you can rest assured legitimately um, with this transition to iOS 6 and 7 that everything we explore will continue to apply. That wasn't the case from iOS 5 to 6, where some fundamental aspects of Objective-C itself were altered. So if you're a bit worried about that, rest assured that we'll be OK. And the transition to iOS 7 should be a fairly smooth one for you if you take things further. Um, beyond that, we will ultimately start in a couple weeks' time with the simplest of Hello World applications and then go much, much beyond that. Um, that's it for tonight. I'll stick around for questions with Rob or RJ. Otherwise, we will see you on Wednesday across the hall in B108. See you then. <laughs>